Welcome to this introduction to Austrian economics, a series of lectures that will hopefully give you an insight and a background to this important school of economic thought. Today, we're going to be discussing who are the Austrian economists and why are they important. To begin with, Austrian economics is not about the economics of Austria. Uh, it's named the Austrian school because many of the leading members over the last 100 years were born there and had their education and formative intellectual development there. But it represents a school of thought that offers a particular insight and perspective on how the market economy and society in general operates. What we're going to be discussing in this first presentation is who are the Austrian economists and why are they important? Well, to begin with, the Austrian school began in the early 1870s. An economist named Karl Menger uh, had become interested in understanding what determined the laws of economics. Uh, he had a job in the Ministry of Prices as a young man, and his charge as a form of economic journalist was to investigate how prices were formed on commodities markets and report on it. But he soon found that the laws of economics, as he had learned it uh, from the classical economists, from Adam Smith to John Stuart Mill, somehow did not jive or really explain how prices emerged and developed and changed on the markets of, of his society. So he began to think about what might be the basis of the value and the prices of goods in society. The end result of it was that in 1871, he published a book which in, e in English has the rather mundane title, Principles of Economics. What he came to argue was that economics is derived from a concept that value is based upon a subjective valuation of the individual. The old phrase, beauty is in the eyes of the holder, in one sense captures the essence of what Menger was saying. The classical economists had said that value was based upon the quantity of labor that had gone into the manufacture of a good. Menger said it was the other way around. It's because people place a subjective valuation on things that they would like to have that they therefore then assign or impute a value to using labor and other resources to bring them to their manufacture. He then, in, then extended that with an idea that is now called marginal utility. And this is basically saying is that we don't deal with, as it used to be said by the classical economists, uh, water versus bread or water versus diamonds and having to have a categorical choice of either or. But it begins with the idea of increments of it. How many shirts do I have in my wardrobe? How many uh, cans of soup do I have in my cupboard? And what are my alternatives and trade-offs of having a little bit more of this versus a little bit more of that? where to have a little bit more of this, I will have to give up some other thing that I could want as well. He therefore argued that the essence of economics is the study of the relationship between people's ends and the discovery by those individuals that the means to achieve them have various degrees of scarcity that requires the individual person to undertake a policy of economizing. From this, he developed the theory of exchange, opportunities that people discover on buying and selling goods and services with each other, and the determination of prices out of the subjective valuations of the transactors. But besides that, another insight that he had was the idea that it's not just economizing that needs an explanation, but how markets themselves emerge and develop, even more so the institutions of society as a whole. And as we will see later on, uh, when we touch upon the subject of the Austrian theory of money, we will see that Menger argued that whether it be language or custom or tradition or law or the general rules of the market as well as money, these are not the creations of governments or benevolent rulers who impose them or establish them by edict or command, but they emerge from the bottom up in spontaneous processes of results of human action but not of human design. When Menger wrote his book, he was very much alone in the in the times of the late 19th century, the 1870s of the Austria in which he was uh, living and working. But he fortunately had two young followers who were inspired by him, even though they did not directly study with him. This was, this was an economist named Eugen von Bumbawerk and an economist named Friedrich von Wieser. They ended up becoming brothers-in-law, but they came to know each other at the university uh, both discovered Menger's principles of economics at about the same time, and 
felt that this book offered a profound insight to the nature and workings of economics. And when they went off to graduate school together at the University of Heidelberg, they each in their own way decided to develop Menger's ideas, extend them, elaborate them, refine them, improve upon them, to extend them in ways that would demonstrate that this idea or set of ideas of Menger's could have comprehensive ability to explain the market and the social processes in the human community. In Bombavrik's case, his interests were in the fields of capital and interest. What is capital? How does it emerge out of people's savings and investment? Uh, how do people make their choices of deciding what is important in the present and the future? The time valuation that individuals make. He also developed Menger's theory of price and value in a much more detailed and specific and, to be honest, convincing way. But besides this, he was also a major critic of Marx and Marxian socialism. Uh, in the late 19th century, he was considered the major critic who in many ways helped uh, undermine, if not to undercut, the fundamental premises of Marxist theory of economic value and the rationale and argument that Marx has made that the workers were exploited uh, by, the, by the capitalists. And I just might mention as an aside, he, Bombavrik was not only a theorist, but he was a man of practical affairs. Three times he was finance minister of the old Austro-Hungarian Empire, the last time for four years at the beginning of the 20th century. And during that four-year period, he undertook his job as a very conscious and serious fiscal conservative. The budget was balanced, spending was actually cut, taxes were reduced, and the economy grew because the market was set loose. His brother-in-law, Friedrich von Wieser, developed Menger's ideas in slightly different ways. He actually was the one who coined the term marginal utility. He formulated this in an early book of his in the 1880s. He also is famous for, in the eyes of practically all economists because he coined the term opportunity cost in place of the old classical or Adam Smith notion that cost is the quantity of labor that goes into the manufacture of a product, uh, Wieser argued that co the cost of anything is the alternative that you forego. If the means are scarce and they could be used for one purpose or another, the purpose that you do not pursue because you considered the other one of greater value or importance to you, that alternative that you give up and set aside to use the means for something else, that is the cost of your choice. And he extended that to explaining in more detail than Menger on how that then got transmitted to explain the value of labor, land, resources, raw materials, as well as capital. He too, by the way, was a man of practical affairs, and he served as the Minister of Commerce in the last wartime Austro-Hungarian government during the First World War. And he also, his last book, a book that came out in the year he passed away in 1926 was called The Law of Power. And that he, like Menger, attempted to explain the laws of the social evolution of institutions, customs, and the marketplace. In the 20th century, the two most important Austrian economists have been Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich A. Hayek. Ludwig von Mises was born in 1881, he passed away in 1972, uh, and he really was the fountainhead of most of the ideas for which the Austrian school became famous in the 20th century. And in these lectures, as they progress, will many, many times come across his ideas and his development of these Austrian themes. To just give a brief reference, he argued that economics was a science of human action. Our concern was explaining the logic and the structure of human activity and human choice making, and that this requires to understand that the methods and the tools of economic reasoning are in many ways essentially different from the methods of science and the natural area of science. At the same time, which really gave him his claim to fame, was his arguments and developments of, of understanding and criticisms about different alternative economic systems, capitalism, socialism, government intervention and regulation. And as we will see, 
he really was the economist who, early in the 20th century, came to challenge the question as to whether socialism was viable as an economic system. He also developed an Austrian theory of the market process, the role of the entrepreneur, the essential significance and importance of economic calculation for market rationality. He also was a major contributor to the theory of money, and based upon that and his analysis of the interactions of savers and investors and the role of government in central banking, he developed a theory of the business cycle in which he connected the theory of money, the capital markets, the investment markets, and the chain of events that could set in motion through central banking and mismanagement of the money supply in the swings of the inflations and depressions of the booms and busts of the financial cycle. And one other major figure, as I mentioned, was Friedrich A. Hayek. Indeed, in many ways, in terms of an international reputation, Hayek almost stands as, as the uh, representative of the 20th century Austrian school, to a great extent because in 1974, he was awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. And for much of that, for his contributions to what Austrian economists view as his views on various Austrian economic themes. In the 1930s and early 1940s, Hayek taught at the London School of Economics, having less left Austria in the early 1930s. And in that capacity, and through his writings on money and the business cycle, throughout the 1930s, he rapidly became viewed as the major and preeminent foil or critic to the emerging Keynesian economics developed by John Maynard Keynes. He also challenged the prevailing theories of mainstream economics, in which he argued that one had to think of markets not as a static equilibrium in the standard models of perfect competition or monopoly, but as a dynamic process of the use of knowledge and rivalry by which supply and demand is brought about uh, into a coordinated uh, pattern through the pricing system. He also was a major critic uh, through those avenues of thought on socialism. And as we will see, he argued the weaknesses of socialism on two counts. One, the danger that it could lead to tyranny. And the second one is that following and developing upon Mises' ideas, there were fundamental flaws that by doing away with competition and a price system, the socialist economic plan could only lead to irrationality, stagnation, and economic decay. And finally, in the 1950s and 60s and into the 1970s, Hayek developed the social side of these theories and developed ideas concerning social evolution, the spontaneous development of many forms of, of social order, and especially the political element of the political institutions that are necessary for a free and prosperous society. There have been other Austrian economists since then, just to name a few, Israel Kirzner, who studied with Ludwig von Mises at, the, uh, at uh, New York University in the 1950s. Murray Rothbard, who while himself earning a degree at Columbia University, was inspired and greatly developed many of Mises' ideas uh, in later years in the 1960s and 70s. And finally, an economist named Ludwig Lachmann, who, while originally educated in Germany, fled Germany with the coming to power of Hitler and the Nazis and earned a degree under Hayek at the London School of Economics, and Lachmann came to have his own interest in the theories of the market process and the theory of capital and economic fluctuations. Since then, from the 1960s and 70s, there has occurred an immense renaissance, a rediscovery, a renewed development of the Austrian school through an entire array of younger scholars who have taken the ideas of these masters of the Austrian tradition and built upon them, extended them, developed them into new and vibrant ways. The Austrian school is not just a chapter in the past history of economics, but it is a frontier of new development and vibrant ideas, challenges, and frontiers of thought. And I hope through these series of lectures, I at least will help you have an understanding of the foundations of the, uh, these ideas that are serving for the future of Austrian economics and therefore the development of economic science in general. Thank you. Until next time. Thank you.